Hello friends, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Dandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. We are a non-profit organization who are trying to address the need for knowledge dissemination and waste management. We provide educational resources, direct access to experts and uh, networking, and we try to build a momentum around the global challenge of waste. Today, we are here in association with Circulate Capital uh, to uh, to disseminate insights from their latest report on safeguarding the plastic recycling value chain based on their study of over 100 interviews across Asia. And uh, to disseminate the study, we have uh, Tam Nguyen, who is the head of operations at GA Circular. They conducted the study. Karina Kedi, operations and investment director at Circulate Capital. Swati Singh Sambhyal, uh, who is a waste management specialist at UN Habitat India, is going to moderate this panel. Along with them, we also have Dini Trusyanti from Sustainable Waste Indonesia. Uh, we have Christian Lau, Vice Chairman of the National Solid Waste Management Associ Commission at Philippines, and Ujwal Desai from Lucroplastic. All three of them were study participants, so they're going to share insights on what the on-ground reality is right now. And along with me, I have Amandine Jolly, who is the communications manager at Circulate Capital. Though she and I would not be speaking in this panel, uh, she is also the co-host of this particular panel. So that's it from my end. I'm handing this over to Swati because we have a very tight schedule planned for the next hour. And just a reminder to everyone, we received your questions in advance, but please use the Q&A section when you have any questions. We'll ensure the questions are shared with the panelists. If you're, if you're unable to get your question answered within the duration of this panel, we'll try to write back to the panelists and try and get responses for it and put it up on the website. Over to you, Swati. Thank you, Shweta, and a very warm welcome to all the attendees who have joined from different parts of uh, the countries, various countries. Um, we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused severe setbacks to the ongoing global movement to tackle plastic waste and to move towards a circular economy. In order to understand the extent of impact in South and Southeast Asia, Circulate Capital commissioned a study, which was carried out by J. Circular, to study challenges faced by the plastic recycling industry in South and Southeast Asia during this time and the interventions needed to sustain it. Uh, based on more than 100 interviews, which included recyclers, recyclers, processors, aggregators, junk shops, and informal sector workers, the study highlights six key COVID-19 impacts on the recycling value chain in India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, and Thailand. Today, we shall discuss the important findings of the report with two speakers who were deeply involved in this work. Um, I'd like to welcome Karina Kedi, who is the Operation and Investor Director at the Circular Capital, and Tan Nguyen, who is the Head of Operations at GA Circular. So without wasting any further time, I would request Tan to uh, do a presentation and share uh, you know, the highlights of the study. Over to you, Tan. Thank you, Swati. Uh, let me just share my screen now. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great. All right. All right. So uh, my session will take up roughly uh, 10 minutes. Uh, today's presentation is a very condensed version of the uh, recent uh, circulate. A capital white paper that was released. So for full de details, if you have not already, I do highly recommend that you uh, have a, give it a read. Uh, just a quick introduction for those who don't know GA Circular, we're a uh, waste management and recycling consulting and strategy firm. Uh, we have a vision for a world without waste and driving that transition through a uh, circular economy. Um, the left here, the visuals just shows a lot of the countries that we've had, had projects and ongoing projects in. And below, you can just see some of the names that we've worked with um, in the uh, government, the uh, private sector, and uh, with the uh, NGOs as well. All right, now we'll dive straight into the uh, key findings. As Swati mentioned, uh, from today's presentation, we'd, we'd like to, uh, for you to take away the six uh, key impacts or findings here uh, from the study. Uh, the first, 
that uh, a significant proportion of the recycling industry was either closed or operating at really low capacities um, due to the COVID lockdowns. And uh, because of that lack of the central uh, service status for the plastics recycling value chain. Uh, second, uh, prices have been significantly impacted. So uh, for recyclers um, and the virgin resin group, uh, recyclers, sorry, for the virgin uh, players as well, but for recyclers has fallen by 21%. Uh, on average, uh, compared year on year. Uh, third, the volume of recycled plastics trade has fallen 50 to 65% for those operating. Um, and this was just based on the uh, interviews that we had conducted across the region. We expect that number to be uh, even higher. And then some of the recyclers that we spoke to uh, were also in line with that view. Uh, they had every, the whole value chain been operating. Fourth, the uh, most vulnerable um, uh, that have been impacted in this case the uh, informal sector and of course the uh, those looking at the low value plastics fifth um, the current uh, value chain uh, sees that there's a there's definitely a, a really low sentiment or lack of confidence um, for a swift uh, recovery going forward a lot of that has to do with um, oil prices which we'll highlight shortly uh, sixth the value chain is is cash strapped and the outlook is uh, poor so uh, we suspect there will be more bankruptcies already there were a few as we went during the uh, field work and then closures are projected as well uh, 40 to 60 percent of the recyclers are in a critical financial position so i'm um, at risk of uh, bankruptcy and closure we then um, highlight the three phases of interventions um, at the end of the study here at the end of the presentation the first will be uh, what is needed immediately in the next uh, three months um, and then the three to six months and finally, uh, beyond uh, yeah, six months, looking at uh, policy interventions and growth opportunities. Um, so right at the start of our study, we had um, before, sorry, right at the start of our study, uh, we had seen that uh, there was a huge challenge facing the recyclers already, and that was around the uh, global crude oil prices. Uh, if you follow my cursor here, uh, even before the COVID pandemic and then the failed oil negotiations, uh, we can see significant volatility and historically low uh, oil prices. Um, and from our study, we found that, uh, speaking to our market sources, that this creates quite a challenge for recyclers because they need to operate at a minimum of uh, 70 US dollars uh, per barrel for it to really be a competitive environment for uh, the recyclers to operate in. Uh, due to those uh, due to the COVID lockdowns and the lack of uh, central service status, um, a significant proportion of that recycling industry had either been closed or operating at uh, very low capacities. Uh, for this first row here during lockdowns, um, you can see the uh, number of uh, recyclers that were operating. Um, so some of the recyclers we've spoken to, they were able to operate uh, because they were servicing industries that were considered a central service. Um, but otherwise, for the stricter lockdown countries, you can see Vietnam, um, India, the Philippines, um, there was much less uh, operating. The uh, post lockdown, um, since, since after uh, the uh, lockdown, we can see the, uh, it did improve a bit the situation, but it's still very much operating below uh, their install capacity as seen here. So we have seen that uh, recyclers have been facing significant challenges because of the uh, global crude oil prices. Um, but this, this slide here is to summarize uh, and to differentiate the two issues. Um, the oil prices um, have been uh, obviously beneficial for uh, virgin plastic demand because it's, it's lowered prices uh, for the virgin resins. And of course, it's made it really hard for the recyclers. But the recent COVID-induced economic downturn um, has obviously had impacted uh, both uh, the industries and everyone at large because of the lockdowns, the continued restrictions, and then the low consumer confidence. And of course, the significant reduce in demand for just plastics uh, overall. What does that mean for uh, recyclers when it comes to their pricing? Uh, it's meant that recyclers have had to slash uh, prices by an average of 21% across the uh, four key resins. Um, this table here, we've grouped the uh, resins, and you can see for PT here, HDPE, LDP and uh, PP. Um, and then with that, we've uh, broken down for the virgin resin, uh, the 2019 pricing, and then during post lockdown, and then recycled resin 
uh, than uh, the 2019 versus the during post lockdown pricing. And what you can see here is for both virgin and recycled resin and for the four uh, resins looked at here that visually um, there has been a significant decline in that, um, and that we're seeing that uh, to be uh, the case uh, going forward. So aside from the low oil prices and then the uh, COVID uh, impacts on pricing, there are also six other impacts that we'd like to highlight. Uh, and they are from left to right here in terms of severity. We have uh, feedstock shortages, uh, the red being uh, impacting all the countries here. Uh, and that's of course due a lot to the changes in the uh, consumption uh, location of uh, consumption then uh, has shifted from the whole record channels, which generally is uh, segregated ways and is a much cleaner stream now to um, household, which is uh, generally just plastics are put together with the uh, mixed ways. Cash flow issues have uh, we've seen for most countries as well as uh, to be a significant issue. Um, the, this again, just because of delayed payments um, and then uh, having to pay for salaries and uh, many other expenses that have uh, come along. Worker shortages uh, for the most part have been uh, a challenge for uh, just India and the uh, Philippines. Fear of catching COVID overall has been a, uh, of course was raised in all of the markets that we had surveyed, but was much of a, higher of an issue in uh, India. And then logistics barriers um, was mainly just in the Philippines. And then the overall, the lack of uh, government support was uh, highlighted in most countries just with troublesome uh, paperwork or being able to find uh, or look for uh, possible uh, funding mechanisms. Uh, looking forward, um, there is still a significant lack of confidence amongst the value chain for a swift recovery. And then the major concern is the projection of the low crude oil prices for the foreseeable future. Um, this here just shows uh, a forecast by the U.S. Uh, Energy Information Administration. Looking um, to 2021, you can see even towards the uh, tail end of it, it will, the price will fluctuate around uh, 50 U.S. dollars per barrel. Uh, with that said, if we recall uh, earlier, I had mentioned uh, market sources that Shared with us that it, there needs to be at least a minimum of a 70 US dollar price pricing for for, uh, it's, for recyclers to really be able to uh, compete. So with that kind of forecast that I've been uh, floating around, there's been a lot of uh, concern in the industry of how we'll uh, we really be able to address that. Based on our findings, we've grouped the uh, situation for recyclers into the three categories here. Um, the first we estimate less than 10 to 20 percent are in a healthy financial position about 30 to 50 percent can continue uh, their operations and 40 to 60 percent are in uh, critical financial uh, positions this is just uh, some of the uh, verbatim here that we received from uh, during our surveys um, this says uh, of the 47 pt recyclers in india 15 are closed and the remaining 32 are operating at 25 to 30 percent capacity and are not selling all output. If the situation continues for the next three, six months, 50% are expected to go uh, bankrupt. So this is from the Recycler, Recycling Association in India, just to really highlight um, and bring to life the situation on ground in the countries. Uh, finally, we'll move on to the three phases of interventions. For the interventions, we've categorized um, into the different um, uh, sectors here. So first we have is the philanthropic sector, uh, the industry and brand owners, investors and government. And uh, for the sake of time, I'll just cover what is in phase one, which is the immediate uh, intervention needed uh, within less than uh, six months. For the uh, philanthropic sector, refining existing grant programs include waste pickers, the most critical and vulnerable workers in that value chain, and then promoting and uh, providing guidance on grants and giving initiatives that are available to those uh, formal and informal waste work sector workers providing uh, targeted guidance on loan and grant programs to operators, and then continue to provide informal sector collectors with uh, PPE and food supplies. For the industry and uh, brand owners, practically engaging their suppliers to really commit to uh, buying recycled materials and providing uh, guarantees uh, for that offtake, and then really reaffirming to local and domestic commitments to recycle content targets and EPR commitments. Uh, and then extending COVID-19 mitigation uh, SOPs to recyclers and aggregators. For investors, it is providing short-term uh, low interest loans and other immediate financial support to operators. 
communicating those timelines and steps in that financing process and having a roadmap for them. And then seeking to include the informal sector voices uh, in livelihood investments. For government, the immediate intervention needed is recognizing that uh, recycling value chain as an essential service. Um, and then reducing or delaying tax payment burdens for recyclers and uh, other formal value chain businesses. And then enabling uh, exports of recycled plastics. Um, and then finally raising awareness of the uh, issue and including recyclers and waste pickers, waste pickers as well as an essential service for uh, prioritization for relief. And this uh, summarizes the uh, phase two and phase three uh, interventions as well. So just to call out uh, some quick ones uh, for the philanthropic sector, extending uh, vocational skills training and education, um, access programs to formal uh, sector waste workers and their families, providing technical assistance and capacity building to recyclers and suppliers to improve quality and performance. Um, for the industry, brand owners, uh, working with uh, recyclers to develop food grade resin capabilities and capacity, um, including recycling, sector engagement, employee mentor, uh, coaching opportunities, and then focusing on protecting worker health, and increasing engagement with those workers. For the investors uh, in phase two, accelerating financing dedicated to the sector, strengthening social uh, risk insurance and investment decisions, and then uh, providing access to training for portfolio and pipeline companies to strengthen supply uh, chain resilience and then provide uh, structured mentoring and coaching for financial planning and operations. For the government, it would be uh, really supporting the uh, recycled content targets. Uh, for a full list uh, yeah, in details, uh, I do again want to recommend uh, to take a look at the uh, white paper. Uh, with that, uh, I will hand it back to uh, Swati and Swata. Thanks, Tam. I was just about to tell you that you're <laughs> the time's up, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I think without wasting any time, I'd ask uh, Karina to take over and present. Yeah. Over to you, Karina. Great. Thank you, Swati, Swata, and Tam. So, hi, everyone. I am Karina Cady, the Operations and Investment Director at Circulate Capital. And you know, as we've just heard, the investment in waste management and recycling value chain is needed now more than ever. The million dollar question, or I guess in this case, the billion dollar question is, where is this money going to come from? Because you know, typically we would need to be from institutional investors who are financing the future of infrastructure in South and Southeast Asia. But unfortunately, institutional investors are currently not enabled to fund these solutions at scale. There's a lack of visible pipeline or evidence-based track record. There's also a lack of supportive ecosystems that you know, ultimately have resulted in what we refer to as the missing middle, which is failing to connect capital to operators. So we are financing scaled solutions that attract institutional investors into the sector through catalytic capital. This is a new blended financing mechanism to demonstrate investment viability that will facilitate the allocation of public and private sources of capital and divert plastic from the environment. So it adds viable projects and projects and companies to the investment pipeline from you know the startup phase right through to growth expansion and then handing off to those institutional investors once projects can reach scale so just some background for those of you who might not be aware of circulate capital circulate capital ocean fund is the world's first investment fund dedicated to preventing ocean plastic pollution in south and southeast asia the Ocean Fund is backed by leading global companies. That's including PepsiCo, Procter & Gamble, Dow, Danone, Chanel, Unilever, the Coca-Cola Company, and Chevron Phillips Chemical, as well as the United States International Development Finance Corporation, or DFC. They provide a guarantee on some of our loans, which has helped to further de-risk these deals. We raised 106 million US dollars to invest in startups and SMEs across the plastic value chain, this, they, these investments reduce plastic pollution, as well as demonstrate that investing in the circular economy can generate attractive financial returns. The companies that we work with are sticking with their commitments to move towards recycled packaging products, reaffirming their long-term sustainability commitments. When we speak to them, you know, it's clear that they don't want us to slow down. They definitely do not want us to stop. They see the companies that we are investing in on their behalf as more important now 
than ever. We believe that it is our role as investors to really help these companies that are in our portfolio as well as our pipeline to succeed. And in order to do this, you know, we need to be by their side in good times, but even more so in difficult times. So this is why in addition to financing, we also help out our portfolio companies to review their business plans and strategies so that they can adapt accordingly and connect them to our network to provide mentorship, connect them into supply chains of multinational companies for potential supply agreements. For the companies in our pipeline, we're moving forward with the due diligence process because one, this is essential, but also we cannot invest in a pre-COVID business plan, right? These are based on pre-COVID assumptions. So we're working with them on their short-term needs. We are, for example, considering short-term deadlines. We're supporting them in redefining the right growth plans ultimately for their business, uh, for I think the context today and in the future. So let me introduce you to these two companies who are great examples of the kind of models that generate economic, but social and environmental value. And I'll explain why we invested in them. So Lucro in Mumbai, who's CEO and co-founder Ujwal is on our panel today. They are a homegrown manufacturer that specializes in recycling difficult to manage flexible plastics for their own production and sale as high quality commodities to other facilities across the country. A circular capital invested in Lucro because they are an excellent team with an entrepreneurial mindset. They've established operations with a proven business model and a focused expansion plan. There is a great market opportunity for recycling flexible plastic. This is a material that, as many of you on the call know, frequently gets left behind in collections, and we believe that Lucro is well positioned to capture it. I'd also like to introduce Treaty Oasis. They operate near Jakarta. They are a startup specialized in recycling PET into our pet flakes. These flakes are then used to manufacture circular packaging as well as textiles. And again, top reason why Circular Capital invested in them, their leadership team. Deanne and Dinda are two inspiring women. And although a relatively young company, Treaty Oasis has already set a standard in Indonesia for transparency and traceability. These are two essential issues for any recycling business that want to operate on an international scale. So, you know, solving the issue is not all about just investing in the circular economy. You know, as Tam outlined in the, in the interventions that are needed, you know, ocean plastics is a systems problem that requires a system solution. Solutions that have to come from stakeholders. This is from public policy to corporate commitments to public private collaboration in order to have these financial incentives and changes in human behavior. You know, becoming more and more open to listening to the voices of those at the front line of the recycling value chain, which is why we are here today. Right? The discussion on the panel is going to focus on how each of us can be a part of the solution. So I'm really looking forward to getting into your questions. I appreciate that was a fast run through. So I thank you very much for your attention. Um, but back to you, Sveta. Thanks, Karina, um, for sharing uh, what does circular capital do and the kind of investments it has made into businesses. Uh, majorly small and medium level enterprises. We shall now have a quick audience poll on what you feel, uh, you know, how, how do you feel these insights reflect uh, the reality of the market? So let's have a quick poll. Fill in your responses. So do you feel the report reflects correctly the on-ground reality? Um, or maybe it reflects some realities, but the situation has improved since July? Or do you feel uh, some realities are correctly revealed, but the situation has worsened? Or you feel the report reflects very little ground reality? So we'll give you a minute. Okay, so great. So most of you feel that the report reflects correctly the 
on ground reality while some of you feel that uh, the situation has improved since july i think keep your questions coming in with want to uh, you know kind of want to hear your take as well and uh, you know just be active on the quick q and a section because uh, yeah um, I think moving on over to the next important uh, part of this uh, discussion is, uh, you know, with three very important participants who have joined us from Indonesia, Philippines, and India. Uh, we have Dini Trishyanti with us, who's a de developmental professional with over 15 years of experience. Uh, she's the co-founder of Sustainable Waste Indonesia, a Jakarta-based research and consultancy firm. Dini, without wasting any time, I think uh, I really want to know from you that since uh, your organization works closely with Waste Pickers Union, how you think that the pandemic impacted them? And also how, what you feel, I mean, what are the tools that we can use to address informalities in the waste sector to ensure that these workers do not bear the brunt of extreme conditions? For instance, presently, the uh, pandemic. Uh, over to you, Dini. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Swati, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dini Trisyanti from Indonesia. Uh, first of all, I'd like to appreciate the team who were involved in the report. Uh, although uh, we were not involved and participated in the report development, but uh, to me, the report gives a feeling that we, as for recycling actors and supporters, are not alone in this difficult situation and that our worries and concerns have been spoken out. Uh, so since 2018, SWI has been working with uh, Waste Speaker Union and Recycler Association. We form a coalition together. So we develop programs and help advocate to governments on the importance of recycling ecosystem. That's what we do. So not only the livelihood of informal actors that we are trying to improve, but also a broader ecosystem that support each other from upstream plastic collection to downstream recyclers. So what happened when COVID hits, since March, we have helped the mobilizing donation to uh, these waste speakers communities to more than 12,000 households of waste pickers, junk shops, aggregators in more than 25 cities, in more than 10 provinces across Indonesia in the form of hand washing station, PPE, food, drinks, sanitizer, and so on. It's because in the early phase of COVID-19 in Indonesia, so around March and April, lots of waste picker only able to drink water for days without food at all and they don't equip with uh, PPE whatsoever. So at that time, uh, we are very grateful that receive, to receive donations from individuals and corporates and support from our fellow recyclers. So around 20 entrepreneurs or recyclers uh, within our network uh, were voluntarily helping us in distributing these donations. So uh, our coalition believes that uh, informal sector of recycling uh, can be synergized with formal municipal waste management systems. Uh, my core expertise is actually waste engineer. And therefore, uh, I always emphasize that solving surface delivery of waste within the city is actually the backbone to overcoming the plastic pollution issues and not the other way around. And recycling actors should be the main partner of municipalities in coping with waste generation. So uh, one of our program in our coalition is working with Jakarta municipality to pilot waste segregation at source. We call it Jakarta Recycling Center or GRC, which is in South Jakarta, as well as handling collected plastics from water waterways. So the government collect the uh, plastic from waterways more up in this upstream area, river area, and we help to uh, offtake the plastic collected from these rivers. And still in Jakarta area, our coalition also supports to develop a waste picker business center, or we call it Kawasan Usaha Pemulung or KUP, by upgrading some plastic aggregator location with uh, more decent facility and simple machineries. So this is uh, the ongoing programs that we have within our coalition. 
So uh, although the progress is slow due to the pandemic, these programs, these initiatives uh, that are mostly self-financed by our coalitions, uh, this is to prove that uh, some informal recycling actors, although not the whole informal sector actors, are actually open and willing to and able to cooperate with formal authority. So we've seen that and we proved that. And uh, also another ongoing program that we have is more recycler driven. Uh, so uh, this is some kind of product innovation. So uh, utilization of post-consumer multilayered plastics to become a puffing block and industrial pellet have been trialed by our coalition while also looking for potential of takers and buyers. Uh, however, this will need support from government for recycling content policy and green procurement because this innovation needs a demand. So again, I think this confirms that collaborative movement is fundamental here from upstream to downstream of value chain, from formal to informal, government and non-government, and not to forget consumer perception and contribution. Because a lot of uh, products that we create, the recycler industry create, uh, needs to be accepted by the consumer. If they have a still negative perception on products based on uh, recycling, then it is difficult to create demand. So this is also something that we think very important when we want to safeguard this recycling industry. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Thank I you. think that's from my side, Swati. I, I hope the time is not taking too long. Thank you, Dini. I think thank you for your wonderful insights. Uh, I'll move over to Crispian Lau, who joins us from Philippines. He's the Vice Chairman of the National Solid Waste Management Commission. Uh, Crispian, what you feel should be the interventions required to strengthen plastic value chain systems at local city level? And uh, in your opinion, what sort of support cities or micro and small businesses need in the present context? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. Um, interventions at the city level needs to be aligned or in line with the national agenda. Um, oftentimes, we see a lot of actions at the local level uh, that, that tend to go into quicker solutions like bans. You know, um, uh, I'll give you an example. For example, PET bottles for drinking waters are being banned in some cities right now. Uh, but if you look at the whole landscape of recycling, PET gives you the best price. So if you take that material out, it affects the whole recycling system that, are, that have already been established in a locality. So um, it, it needs to look into the whole life cycle assessment uh, system and sustainability of the replacement products also. Uh, and um, again, inefficient policies needs to be avoided at the city level. But having said that, there's a lot of things that can be done at the city level, at the local level. Uh, first is recognizing the important role of the informal sector. Uh, allow them access to recyclables. Uh, in the Philippines, we have seen a transition wherein um, the police speakers who used to be in the dumps, you know, are now sort of organized into cooperatives so that they can have access to communities to get the materials at source where you get the best value out of it. Uh, um, secondly, you need to, uh, there is a need even at the local level to provide incentives to small businesses that are engaged in recovery and recycling. Now, um, again, getting, getting the incentives from the national level can be a challenge. The local, uh, lo at the local level, there are still opportunities for them to be given incentives. Uh, for, for the cooperatives that can be established or have already been established, and lastly, you know, uh, at the local level, we still have to promote the basic principles of waste avoidance, uh, three R's, and focus on transitioning towards more recycling to, um, to be able to improve the much needed economic activity in this area. So what we're trying to say is that, you know, instead of just outright banning a particular material, can we transition from a disposable product to a recyclable product, provide incentives so the whole ecosystem uh, makes a lot of sense for everyone. So, Thank you so much, Christian, uh, for sharing your insights. Uh, now, uh, my next question is to Ujwal. Ujwal joins us from India. He's a former recycler. He, he has founded a company called Lucro Plastic. 
Um, Ujwal, as we all know that most of the plastics is being downcycled in India and in fact in, in many developing countries, not just India. We still refer to it as recycling, but in reality it's downcycling. What in your opinion should be done to shift to more sustainable systems for plastic recycling? And what do you foresee as the future of recycling, being a formal recycler yourself? Thank you, Swati, for your question. Uh, I would, uh, you know, I would just like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ujwal Desai from Lucro Plus Recycle. Uh, what we do at Lucro is uh, we do everything from collection, segregation, sorting, recycling, and product making. So the whole value chain of uh, plastic recycling is uh, what we are trying to cover. Uh, what I foresee uh, with plastic recycling is uh, more and more plastic recycle needs to be used into the final product making. For example, in India, one of the states, uh, Maharashtra, has mandated 20% use of recycled plastic content for industrial packaging. So these are some of the things that uh, can be uh, done by the governments, by the uh, authorities uh, to improve to give uh, more and more incentives to recyclers. Secondly, also the whole waste picker network. It's such an important network to solve this plastic waste problem. Uh, if we can pay them higher than, higher than the market price, because today there's so much inefficiency in the market. If the person who is collecting at the ground level, if he is paid more uh, for the plastic that is collected, and then when the recycler recycles it, he can, uh, they can basically uh, use it in different products. That would actually help improve this, pro uh, uh, this problem of uh, downcycling. It would actually help people make better products, which will then be called upcycling in the true sense. So these two things is what I feel uh, should be done uh, for solving you know, majority of this. And that's what we at Lupro are trying to do. We are trying to buy plastic waste from waste pickers at a higher than the market price. And then we are converting them into products, which we are again selling it to brand owners or our customers at a price which is a little lower than the virgin. So that's a cost benefit to everybody. The person who's collecting at the bottom level gets paid more and the brand owner, because he's getting at a cost benefit, uh, they are able to, uh, you know, adapt to this new uh, product made out of recycled material. Okay, thanks, Sujwa. Uh, my last question to three of you, uh, which is on how the findings of this report has helped you, you know, probably making better decisions for the future. Uh, you can take half a minute each to answer this. Dini, let's start with you first. Dini, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah, I think for Indonesian point of view, uh, this will help us uh, advocate to uh, especially the government uh, about the situation uh, in our region, actually this is what happened, and uh, the importance of recycling industry is becoming more per, uh, yeah, priority. Uh, this is the base uh, data that we have. So I think this will help us uh, as an advocacy tools to the government. That's uh, the very um, immediate uh, impact that, that, that will be helpful for, for us. Um, Ujwa, and uh, additionally, uh, I mean, about, apart from how the report has helped you, if you could also share, does your company uh, recycles MLPs as well? It's, it's a question by one of the attendees. Yes, we do recycle MLPs uh, up to a certain level. Uh, not all of it is recycled by us. Uh, but yes, we do recycle and we do make some products uh, out of MLP waste also. And uh, how, in your opinion, the report helps you for any kind of future undertakings? So this is, I mean, for us, uh, this was a form, I mean, uh, for the waste management, plastic waste management, this is kind of a formal report, uh, which gives a lot of information uh, as to what is actually happening in different parts of Asia. And, you know, once 
once collaborated together, we can understand what, where, uh, you know, let, let's say in Philippines, what is happening in Indonesia. So that, that just gives a great perspective for us as to what other countries are uh, doing in a sense. Thank you. Over to you, Crispian. Last comments on how the findings of the report will help you. Well, I think uh, the findings would really help uh, see a picture of uh, the landscape of the whole recycling industry. Um, while it helps, uh, it, it, it also calls the attention of policymakers uh, and all stakeholders that a lot of work still needs to be done to ensure that whatever infrastructure that is put in place is sustainable. You know, uh, right now we're always talking about increasing markets for recycled materials, but uh, what actual actions are being done at the local level? If you want to uh, apply it to food grade materials, do you have enough quality uh, or, and acceptability for that to be food grade? So, um, yeah, still a lot of work still has to be done on this on this piece. Thank you. So, uh, of course, we're still not even halfway through and uh, a lot has to be done. So thanks, Dini, Crispian and Ujwal for your uh, valuable insights. And I think it really adds on to uh, the perspective that we're trying to build. Um, in the next, uh, uh, you know, moving on to the next uh, leg, uh, we are joined by representatives from PNG. Uh, we have Park Nara with us. And uh, I have a few questions. Uh, uh, to Park Nara. Um, I hope you're there, Park. Can you just uh, unmute yourself and, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, they're here. Hi, Park. Am I audible to you? Uh, yes, I hope you can hear me. Okay, wonderful. So, Park, moving on straight to uh, uh, the question, what, in your opinion, uh, you know, the findings of this report? What can you take back with you as, as a, you know, as a company and as, as a manufacturer of various plastic, uh, you know, products and consumer products? Uh, what is the take back for you? So thank you very much, uh, Shweta, uh, the panelists and speakers. Indeed, uh, you know, I find the report very useful. Uh, it will be helpful as we share it across uh, within the uh, system internally within our companies. There's one thing, uh, you know, from a practical point of view uh, on what we're actually working on right now. Um, you know, we work with uh, recycling companies, uh, essentially to improve the ways uh, of our recyclability of our products and the way we recycle them. We hope that, uh, you know, in the short and uh, longer term, it uh, will improve the volume and, uh, you know, number of buyers in the system. Uh, as we process, uh, uh, of course, the ecosystem and uh, those uh, involved, uh, you know, from the downstream, upstream, their welfare could as well be improvised uh, because, you know, as a multinational companies, uh, a corporate like us, we always look uh, for ways to find uh, sustainable uh, processes in the system, right? And our collaboration is uh, held very helpful with the circular capital because of the time where we are sitting, uh, you know, we need to fully understand uh, what is happening on the ground. And such intervention uh, evidently has to involve uh, all layers. Uh, we're talking about uh, the government at the policy level. And of course, uh, uh, groups like yourself and experts like the ones we have heard uh, from the panelists. Uh, you know, at the end, we evidently have our philanthropic program, but I think what will make a score uh, for those involved with the circular in the economy is the way we commit ourselves in the EPR and an improvement in the processes. Um, that's what I have, Shweta. Uh, thank you so much. My other question to you is that how COVID-19 has changed PNG's interaction with various supply chains, any steps taken by you to adopt more sustainable options? Oh, most certainly, most certainly. I mean, uh, you know, since the onset, uh, we realized that there is a, you know, uh, a lowering in the um, uh, buyers and the volume. Uh, so as I was saying earlier, um, uh, you know, we work, we, we work with uh, Circle Capital as well as, uh, you know, uh, our current recycling companies uh, basically to expand in the ways that our products can be recycled, right? 
And so down the line, that's where our expectation will be basically uh, is to improve the welfare, uh, you know, like uh, the waste banker, waste speakers and all that. Right? Thank you so much. I think uh, now we come to the time where we take a few of your questions. Um, and uh, I really thank all of you because I see a question for almost every speaker. I think uh, let's start with a question for Dini, which says that uh, Dini, the study indicated that the government was very weak in Indonesia. What would you like the government to do more of to support you? Over to you, Dini, and please ensure that you're very concise in your responses. Yeah, thank you, Swati, and thank you all for the question. Uh, I think when we see the government uh, response and uh, the policy in Indonesia, there are uh, sort of uh, challenging uh, policy like excise, tax, banning for plastics. The way I see this policy is not really supporting, it's because there's no differentiation between the recycling plastic and the plastic. Uh, only the plastic. So uh, it is true that uh, we need to reduce the plastics by all of these instruments. But what we need to also recognize is we need to differentiate the recycling plastic. Please exclude the recycling plastic from the excise. Please exclude from the banning because this actually helps to reduce the waste by post-consumer uh, collection and so on. That's one thing. And uh, the next one is, we hope that the, the government also put a, a concrete uh, policy on recycling, recy recycled content, because even though it's down cycle, it's necessary for, for uh, creating the market. And the food grade recycled content also needs to be speed up because people already start this seven years ago, but up to now, it's still not yet clear. And I really hope also that the green procurement uh, program is really uh, taking into action and local government should prefer to buy from the recycling uh, products instead of uh, non-recycling. So I think that's the second one. And the third one, I think in Indonesia, the local government who are in charge mostly for waste management system needs to be also uh, assisted very closely because surface delivery is the key for, for plastic collection because we cannot always rely on informal sectors or source segregation. Uh, it needs to be a more emphasis on waste, uh, local waste manager. And I really also hope that uh, the policy like the land policy is also supportive because creating a recycling center, which is sometimes informal land is used because it's idle land, it's considered illegal sometimes. So that kind of thing uh, locally, uh, I hope that it could be more uh, supported by the government from all levels, from local, provincial and national levels. Uh, thanks, Tini. Uh, my next question is open to the floor and anyone who wants to take it can, uh, you know, just let me know. Uh, we all know that packaging has been a huge issue presently. Also, our dependence on single-use plastics has increased manifold in the pandemic period. In such a scenario, how will the market switch to alternatives? And is the industry willing to invest in such interventions? And are you seeing funding potential in this area? So. Karina, Tam, um, Crispian, any one of you can take this. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly start and then maybe I think pass it around to get the, the varied views because, um, yeah, that's a, uh, it's a good question. So, you know, I mean, ultimately we need to be able to encourage more and better businesses to get involved in finding solutions to the awesome plastic problem, right? And so that's across the plastic value chain from innovative materials right through to advanced recycling. Um, so, you know, specific to the question about is industry willing to invest? Uh, absolutely, yes, they already they already have both within their supply chains, and then this is also a key part of what we are aiming to catalyze. Um, but so, yeah, happy to also hand over to to Tam, who speaks to a wide variety of stakeholders. Tam. Uh, thanks. Yes. Thanks, Karina. I, I think yeah, to echo what Karina had shared, um, you know. Uh, We've been conducting quite a few uh, studies and research across the region for a number of stakeholders. And 
there's definitely now a an, an openness and a willingness to um, invest. And there's a lot of due diligence uh, happening to look at what are the options. I think the first step right now is we're seeing a lot of just baseline research to understand that situation and then where what are possible substitutes and, and materials within each uh, of the markets in, in this region. Um, so there's definitely a lot of momentum. And then with as you know, policy is being discussed in some of these uh, countries as well. That should be a, a driver and a push for investments to happen, right, as, as suggested in, in our research as well. Okay. Um, Crispian, would you like to answer a part of it? Uh, just to quickly add to that, uh, when you look at um, transition, uh, uh, it, this is a new normal for everybody. Um, delivery systems has, has changed. You know, you don't really get a lot of uh, waste generated from commercial establishments. It's coming more from the households. Um, um, what, what is important is that when we transition to alternatives, these alternatives, number one, should be locally sourced. Uh, we should avoid a scenario wherein we become very strict to a point that the local lo uh, recycling or even manufacturing industry would not be able to cope up. So whatever transition needs to be local. Uh, and you can see that some of the, uh, the, the, the shift has, uh, that are already implemented are going towards more recyclable products, like take out, uh, take out uh, delivery systems from what used to be packed in plastic bags are now packed in microwavable plastic uh, containers that can be reused and recycled. So I think it's important also to have the right messaging uh, because um, the, we, we experience a shift to paper alternatives that also needs to be disposed of that has no uh, recycling alternative for the Philippines. So it worsens the whole infrastructure or, or the lack of it. You know? So again, we, we should look into really transitioning more into recyclable products uh, that are locally sourced. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Crispin. Uh, my next question, um, I think again, whosoever wants to take it, uh, it's what are some of the innovative approaches for cities wishing to manage low value plastic waste items? And we all know that in Southeast Asia and South Asia, this is a huge issue. So open to the floor. Yeah. So I'll, I'll kick it off again. Um, I mean, I think, you know, something that uh, is, is certainly, I think, resonates for cities across the region, you know, the key role that governments have to play um, in order to encourage demand for recycled and circular materials. You know, they do this through the regulation of the recycled content requirements, um, which you know, was also highlighted in the report. They also, you know, provide incentives to be able to see companies innovate and just take leadership in that space. So, you know, when we've seen governments across the region, they're take an active role in this, whether it's from you know, EPRs, regulations, or, you know, some of the, the ambitious plastic waste elimination targets, um, all of this uh, directly uh, impacts the abilities for cities to find and innovate on those solutions. Thanks, Karina. Um, anyone else wants to take this? Um, if not, we move yeah. to the next question, uh, which is quite yeah, interesting. Uh, the, yeah, yes, yes, I think for multi-layer, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'd like to add about the multi-layer plastics. Uh, actually, there are a couple of innovate, innovative uh, programs uh, started by a lot of uh, entrepreneurs trying to make it some kind of uh, bricks or pallets or uh, some other materials uh, mixing with the building materials and so on. But it's a matter of uh, creating the demand for this one. So uh, we are uh, trying to promote these innovative products to the government and local governments also because these building materials can actually uh, replace the needs of uh, you know, uh, other uh, um, building materials conventionally. And uh, for uh, yeah, plastic to diesel uh, also is being discussed in Indonesia, but it's a matter of uh, criteria for uh, this fuel because there are specific standards for uh, fuel to be commercialized. So there's also another issues for uh, low value plastics. And also we do have actually uh, alternatives as uh, uh, co-firing in the cement kiln. But again, the cost for logistic 
uh, to take the, these materials to Sebeb Kiln, which is not really uh, spread it, is an issue there. So I think this is something that is very still challenging uh, to, to solve. Yeah, and then I think I'll just really quickly add that, you know, um, I'd recognize that there are some SMEs and startups that get, I'd say, nervous about um, uh, trying to look into that, uh, into, into MLP and other, other low value um, plastics, but you know, that they really are at the forefront of being able to drive innovation into this sector. And so, I mean, maybe just like quickly to, to Ujwal, I mean, like, like I said earlier, you know, Lucro are in, um, you know, right in the flexible space. They have uh, been at the forefront of, of driving the, the market, um, for flexibles and then also now, you know, looking, uh, like you said earlier, with their with their MLP support. So um, I think maybe like Ujwal, if you could share just from a recycler's perspective, um, you know, like what gives you confidence about working in that space around with flexibles and other um, difficult to recycle materials? So uh, difficult to recycle material is something that, you know, if we know how, what value it can add, uh, because if you see uh, approximately 40 to 45 percent of the total plastics uh, that are produced, at least in India, are all flexibles in nature. So where the packaging is uh, used. So if we can convert some of this material uh, from recycled content, uh, that's where we see the future, and that's what we we are very excited about. Uh, if we can, uh, you know, use the waste to convert it into some kind of uh, packaging. And uh, that's where we see the future going ahead. Uh, thanks, Sujwal. Um, I think uh, last question that, uh, you know, I would like to take from the audience poll is that, uh, in your opinion, does the recycling sector slows down the transition of the industry to a bio-based economy with brands pushing towards or trying to maintain the status quo of plastics as the only alternative to packaging? A very interesting question. Yeah, if I can take that. Um, if you look at the bio-based alternatives for plastics, um, you have to consider as to whether or not you have industrial composting facilities that can take in. You know, uh, you have to look at the landscape of waste management in your country. Uh, in a country like the Philippines, um, who is still struggling to manage its biodegradable waste, which is 56% of the total waste, um, are we adding pressure to that uh, to that system? And uh, again, it's uh, it still uh, boils down to a question of affordability. Um, uh, it still costs uh, a lot, uh, so we still have to see uh, that to be developed uh, and. Food security here in Asia is one, one of an important aspect. Huh? So again, um, you, you, we have to be very careful transitioning to those kinds of al alternatives because you might end up uh, make plant crops for packaging rather than for food. So these are some of the things that we have to watch out for if, if that is the direction that we choose to go to. Yeah. Thanks, Crispian. Um, I think lastly, I would want to hear your last thoughts. Karina and Tam, to you, where, uh, what's next after this report? Or how do you want to carry this, this intervention and the learnings of this interventions into implementation or advocacy or policy front? And to Dini, Crispian, and Ujwal, uh, you know, what next? I mean, what are three of you trying to do to bring change um, in terms of, uh, you know, the pandemic? What after that? So. So, you know, what, what is the future that you see in terms of plastics and sustainable recycling? So, Karina and Tam, firstly to you, uh, which is how you want to take the learnings of the study forward, which is very, very important. And then over to Denny, Crispian and Ujwal. Yeah, so, I mean, I think for, for us, it's really an indication that we need to, I'd say, double down in our efforts, right? The circular economy is a critical part of this solution and we are you know believing in the cooperation amongst all actors so that's you know governments investors uh, formal and informal uh, act actors and, and sector participants you know we cannot just do this alone it is not just up to investment um, to be able to solve this challenge like i said before 
Um, this is a systems problem. Ocean plastic pollution primarily comes from mismanaged waste, waste that is either not collected or adequately managed. So, you know, we at, at one hand, right, Asia is a powerhouse of consumption and production. And I think that like, even though that some of the, these findings can seem overwhelming, this also shows that we have a great potential to showcase how circular economy can be effective at scale. And I think that now is really this opportune time to be able to bring all these parties together and accelerate our action. All right, thanks, Karina. Just, I think she's really summed it up. If I could just add that we, we, you know, based on our research and studies over the past few years, this is not really a new issue. And COVID has just really exacerbated the situation. And uh, it really is a system uh, change that, that is required. And from here, we, our wish uh, to see this report as, as a start to create visibility uh, into the recycling, uh, the plastic recycling value chain, the help that's needed, and then for brand owners and, and government to uh, act as soon as possible. Thanks, Tam. Dini? Uh, yeah, I think for me, uh, the first one is, uh, even though the report is not uh, uh, so good in, I mean, in the condition, representing the condition, I think uh, for recyclers in Indonesia, we still uh, have to have a feeling that we need to survive this, so we need to be super creative in handling these issues. That's why uh, a lot of the recyclers that I know, they shift their uh, way of thinking and be more creative on uh, looking at the new products and so on. That's one thing. And another thing is I think uh, the whole change of this uh, plastic value chain that needs to collaborate together is it's cliche, but it's really, really something to do. Uh, we need to be more uh, strongly advocate to the government that if this industry collapse, then there will be more ways to the landfill or maybe in the environment because th these are the ones who offtake the, the waste that was supposed to, supposed to goes to the landfill. So uh, I believe that uh, I still uh, try to be optimistic because uh, this is, uh, we, still, we still have to face it anyway. So uh, for uh, that, that, that collaborative movement, I think becomes more, uh, uh, seen within this report and hopefully that uh, the government as the decision maker uh, are uh, getting more uh, aware of the situation uh, after this. Thanks, Denny. Crispian, over to you. Yep, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, the, a key factor that we need really to look into would be the market. Uh, I'd like to see more of market-driven uh, interventions rather than a policy-driven intervention. It has to start somewhere. Um, Dini mentioned about collaboration. Collaboration is very important. Uh, you need to put the, the whole landscape in place. Uh, and then you just need the policy to support it. You know, uh, in terms of policy, it takes time for, uh, you know, coming from the policy side of government, it takes time really to develop appropriate policies, implementable policies. You know, we can't copy and paste existing policies. It has to be something that is applicable to the local conditions, mindful of uh, the local infrastructure. Uh, and having said that, I think what's important is uh, it has to be driven really by the brands, uh, by the private sector. It has to be inclusive, uh, wherein all the stakeholders, all the play uh, uh, um, across value and waste chain um, have a role to play and everybody has to, to play that role. And then government will just have to come up with um, enabling policies to really put a, a good system in place. So again, the pilots are very important and it is an opportunity for us to really look into those. Thanks, Crispian. I think you, you took my summary speech, so I'll have to find something else. Uh, Ujwal, last thoughts? So, uh, I mean, what we are excited, as I said earlier, you know, uh, more and more recycled content in different products. So we are uh, working and we are currently manufacturing products which are made from 30% to 80% recycled content. And uh, we are promoting these products. Uh, so 
looking ahead, we we feel you know if more and more recycled content can be used in different products, uh, that's how this uh, whole industry on a whole can actually be used for uh, uh, the whole collection as well as uh, recycling can be further uh, driven and also uh, we can give something to the brand owners where they see more value out of the recycled content. Thanks, Sujwal. So um, I think closing it and then handing it over to Shweta, I would just sum it up as, um, you know, there must be something extremely good and something extremely bad about plastics. And maybe that's why the world is talking about it. And all of us have uh, gathered together from different parts of the world to discuss this issue. But I feel we need to find a middle path, which is to use this, uh, you know, resource more responsibly, more sustainably, but at the same time, find way for better eco-friendly alternatives. So I think these are my last, last thoughts. Uh, thank you so much. Shweta, over to you. Thank you, Swati. Thanks a lot for moderating this uh, on time and actually packing so much information within the one hour. I think that was great. Thanks a lot to all the panelists. First of all, thank you to Circular Capital and GA Circular for coming out with this study in such a timely and quick manner. And uh, thank you to Dini, Crispian and uh, Ujwal for taking the time out today and to uh, share their thoughts over here. And thanks to all the attendees who tuned in. We had quite a vibrant audience today. I just want to remind everyone that our, all our panelists have tried to answer as many questions as we can. We still have about eight questions which are unanswered, which we will ensure is sent back to the panelists and we receive the response for it. The recording of this particular webinar will be up on the Be Waste Wise website by tomorrow and we'll try to get the answers as soon as possible as well. Uh, just a reminder to everyone before you log out, we will be sending out a survey from Circulate Capital's end uh, tomorrow in your follow-up email. Please take, it'll take you a couple of minutes, please fill it out and so that we all know what your thoughts are about the study as well as the webinar at large. And uh, on BeWasteWise's end, please head to our website and sign up for our newsletter. You will get updates about the future webinars that we are organizing. We have another one which will happen in October and we have two webinars every month. So thanks a lot. Have a, I think most of you are from Asia, so have a good day. I hope the rest of your day goes well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.